breath. So I'm Candle Summers, one of the teachers facilitators at Portland Insight Meditation Center, and it's always a joy to be here. So I just wanted to say greetings to anyone who might be new. I'm going through the boxes. Maybe you could raise your virtual hand if you haven't been here before. I really like to take time to welcome everyone. We all come from many age differences and ethnic backgrounds. We have different cultural heritages and religious backgrounds. We come from various socioeconomic groups and abilities, sexual orientation and gender identity. And we come together and study together and take the time to really welcome each other in all of our rich complexities of our various identities, including dimensions I might not have mentioned, and that we honor each of you in the work that we're undertaking and offer a heartfelt welcome. And it's also important to acknowledge and recognize and honor the indigenous peoples of this region, wherever we are, whose ancestral lands the, we sit on. Here in Portland, it includes the Willamette and Clackamas, the Multnomah, 30 tribes and bands who today make up part of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde, and the Cowlitz, and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz, and many other Native communities. They've made their home along the confluence of the Willamette and Columbia Rivers for 11,000 years, and really appreciating everything that has been contributed, particularly being aware of present situations or who is closest to us. The Warm Springs Reservation here sits on the iconic landmarks of Mount Hood to the north and Mount Jefferson to the south and the Deschutes River to the east. It's a very large um, reservation and it houses three Native American tribes, Warm Springs, Wasco and Paiute. And a while back I went to, I, I, like, I, I like to subscribe on Instagram to the Indigenous People's Marketplace. So if you ever have a chance or you're a person who does social media things. Uh, in Portland, the Indigenous People's Marketplace has different weekends all over town where they um, sell crafts from all the different tribes that come together. And as we include this welcoming of each other and gratitude for the lands that we inhabit. May we also acknowledge the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, the teachings of the Buddha, who has shown us the way, given us the opportunity to realize for ourselves that we can have freedom in this very life, freedom from suffering, freedom from attachment and grasping, that as we notice grasping and attachment, and we notice as it lets go, the freedom that happens in the mind from that grasping. And so the teachings, the Dhamma, the teachings of the Buddha have been passed down to us through many generations, 2,600 years. Lay people, monks, nuns have all been able to transfer the information verbally and then written. And so we have many, many sanghas behind us. And we have our own, this lovely morning sitting group and all the others that are offered at PIMC. So we do not do this in a vacuum. 
and we call upon the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha paying homage in the safety of that container. We can take time to really see what arises in the mind, bringing mindfulness to the foreground. Settling in our seats, feeling gravity, noticing our buttocks on the chair or the cushion, we might notice touch points of where the arms are touching the body or the hands are touching themselves or whatever they might be touching. If we're moving, we notice the intention of moving before the movement starts. Once we begin to settle, we may very easily notice the breath. We can notice it in the belly, the diaphragm, the rising and falling, pressure, warmth, tingling, we may notice the difference on the inhale, a certain kind of pressure and on the exhale, another kind of pressure. Moment to moment awareness, bringing ourselves into a more stable, relaxed body position. And as we choose the touch point or the breath as an anchor to return to, we may notice changes that occur. In bodily sensations. in mental formations. And we hold it all with kindness. We hold ourselves in goodwill, appreciation and gratitude for the very fact that we're sitting here, that we're taking this time to be present with whatever arises.
We use this breath or the touch point as an anchor. We very quickly see how easy it, easily it is for the mind to run off in a lot of directions. And so in our gentleness and in our establishing stability, we can gently bring ourselves back to this breath or back, back to this touch point. It helps create the container of kindness for ourselves. The beginnings of concentration, the concentration that can lead to the ability to not get quite so caught up in the hindrances when they arise. In the beginning, also, there's always lots of restlessness or aversion, grasping and clinging or doubt in the practice, agitation in the mind. And we can begin to hold these hindrances with gentleness, just part of what's happening. This is what's happening in the mind right now, whatever it is. Not having judgment Just being present.
As we sit, we may notice the breath changes. Sometimes it becomes very faint, but there might be something else that is your anchor. You might notice your heartbeat. You might notice the nervous system flowing through your body. We might open up to the other senses of hearing and seeing, tasting, touching, smelling, thinking. Having just enough effort and interest to investigate what's arising. We may notice if it's pleasant or unpleasant or neutral, the Vedana, the feeling tones. Mindfulness is present with everything that we notice as awareness is there. Wisdom can arise and shine that light of insight into what's happening. Sometimes many thoughts tumble into the mind. They might be repeated ones. Some may be skillful, some may be not so skillful. We can just make a gentle note of what's arising. We can notice if it's skillful, we incline the heart and mind toward that, toward kindness, toward compassion, toward equanimity. Toward concentration. Toward mindfulness.
breath by breath, we just keep returning, waking up in this moment. Being aware whenever we can be is a moment of joy. Joyfulness in waking up to this present moment, noticing what's happening in the heart, what's happening in the mind right now. inclining the heart and mind toward gentleness, kindness, compassion. As we clearly watch the array of events go by in the mind, there's a place underneath that flowing river of thoughts. That stillness can be accessed. Returning to the present moment, returning to the anchor of the breath in the body or the touch point. Always beginning again. Returning to noting when something becomes prevalent, we might have a thought that occurs over and over again. We can just note it as whatever it is, thought about work or thought about something that might be troubling us or even something that might be bringing us joy. Joy and sorrow, they all arise within this fathom long body and mindfulness sees it all with neutrality and awareness is present holding it wisdom is present letting go of what's unskillful and inclining toward what's useful helpful skillful for holding ourselves We're seeing things clearly. And once we begin to see clearly, we notice that suffering arises because we grasp at or cling to a point of view or something that's pleasant we like to hang on to and something that's unpleasant we push away. But mindfulness holds it all. Awareness sees it all. And those are our moments of freedom.
breath by breath, we return again. Waking up in this moment. What is happening now? How can we maintain interest? Just enough energy to be interested in this moment, the rising and passing of this moment, seeing it clearly, trying to see what's arising, noticing how long it lasts, and when does it disappear? This beginning, middle, and end of moments is a way of understanding impermanence, especially with the breath. We can't hang on to it. It's going to breathe us. It's going to begin again when it ends at the bottom of the inhale. It will start again at the top of the exhale. That's just the example we use because it's with us all the time. But we can use any moment to see its beginning, middle, and end realizing impermanence, realizing the transient nature. But if we grasp and cling, there's bound to be some suffering. And that there is freedom as we understand the Eightfold Path. Right mindfulness is part of the Eightfold Path. Staying interested and alert, at ease. Bringing kindness to ourselves. May I be at ease. Letting ourselves be held in this kindness 
as we continue moment by moment, breath by breath, being as present as possible to what's occurring, how long it lasts, that it's not personal, can't be clung to. And as we hold ourselves in this kindness, goodwill, as it permeates our being, this loving kindness can grow as our background theme a kind and loving presence that infuses every effort that we make in our training. May we let this infusion of kindness flow to others.
And even as we are nurturing this loving kindness, it doesn't mean that we have to like everything. Sometimes it's misunderstood that to have loving kindness, we need to attempt to make ourselves like everything. We don't have to convince ourselves that we like pain or grief or unrequited love or decaying sense of faculties or a past friend that haunts us. Really, metta is better understood as the heart that does not dwell in aversion. May we have a heart that does not dwell in aversion. Not dwelling in aversion toward anything. even those people who are difficult for us. we begin to understand that there's a place in our hearts where we know that everything has a role in nature. The whole spectrum of seemingly unlikable, repulsive, and utterly despicable. It's all part of nature arising and passing away. And so this loving kindness is the quality of allowing and accepting these things as part of the whole picture. So as we allow ourselves to dwell in this goodwill, may it include all of those that we come into contact with. May we accept fully everything that exists, all of life's panorama. May we dwell in a heart free from aversion. May these thoughts of goodwill, the inclination of the heart and mind to include others. This stream, this vast ocean of unconditional love, may we nurture it. May we dip in it, bathe ourselves in it. And may that include others, even difficult beings and difficult situations. 
May all these beings be free from harm, safe and protected, and have ease. Those that are known and unknown to us, those who are enlightened, those who are unenlightened, May hearts be filled with kindness, those that are seen and unseen, as we develop this loving kindness and goodwill, as it opens our hearts and includes others. Those that swim and fly and walk and crawl below the ocean surface, those soaring above, seen and unseen. May we hold all beings in our hearts. Anicca vata sankara, uparavaya domino, upakita va meruchanti, te sam vapasamo, suko. All conditioned things are subject to impermanence. They arise and pass away. Seeing this clearly through the direct experience Seeing this clearly with mindfulness brings the greatest happiness. And that greatest happiness is peace. Thank you so much for your practice today. May it bring you great joy and know that it has benefit to others. And before we talk about other things, I wanted to read a passage from out of a book called Small Boat, Great Mountain. If anyone has ever heard of Achan Amaro, Achan Amaro uh, has been an abbot for a long time at Abayagiri Monastery in Redwood City in California, and now he's been the abbot at um, Amaravati, the one in England. When Achan Sumedo, you hear him referred to quite a bit, uh, resigned as abbot, Achan Amaro took over. And this is a beautiful book of his, Theravadan Reflections on the Natural Great Perfection. And it's a section out of when where he's talking about wise kindness. Um, and this is one little reading from When the Worst Happens. One of the stories I like to tell is a tale of Venerable Master Xuan Hua's teacher. Master Hua was the abbot of the city of 10,000 Buddhas. He was the person who gave us the land where our monastery is situated. That's when he was in California. Uh, let's see, I lost my place. And he and Achan Sumedo were very good friends. Master Hua's teacher, Venerable Master Su Yun, was the patriarch of all five lineages of Buddhism in China and was very highly respected. He was the head of the Chan lineage, 
the sutta lineage, the mantra lineage, the vinyaya lineage, and the esoteric lineage. It's no secret that different sects tend to argue with each other. Yet he was so indisputably pure and skilled that everyone wanted him to be the head. When the Red Chinese took over, they were trying to wipe the Chinese, they were trying to wipe our religion, out religion altogether, and so he became a very obvious target. The Chinese army attacked his monastery when he was about 110 years old. They beat him with wooden clubs until he was a bloody heap on the ground and left him for dead. Even though he had broken bones and damaged organs, he recovered. The news of his survival spread around the area. A while later, the Red Army came back and used iron bars to beat him until he was a complete mess. This frail old man was really smashed up and seriously injured and yet he still didn't die. His disciples were nursing him and trying to help heal his deep and serious wounds. All of them were amazed that he was still alive. Needless to say, he had incredible meditative powers. So his disciples were convinced that he was sustaining his life energy for them. They believed that the master realized the feeling of grief they would have when he died because they were all very devoted to him. And so they implored him, please don't stay alive just for our sakes. We're very touched that you would endure the weeks and weeks of pain and misery because of not wanting to leave us grief stricken. But it's time, but if it's time for you to die, we would prefer that you just let yourself go peacefully instead of enduring all this agony. And he said, what I'm doing is not for you. It's true, I'm keeping myself alive, but it's not for your sake. It's for the sake of the soldiers. If I died as a result of their beatings, the karmic retribution for those who attacked me would be so great, I couldn't bear to be responsible for that. After that, the army left him alone. He survived and even taught retreats again. The book Chan and Zen Training, translated by Charles Luke, are from the Dharma talks that he gave at a retreat four years later. He died when he was 120. He had made a vow to be a monk for 100 years. So, not dwelling in aversion toward anything. It is doable. It is not easy, but it is doable. May we keep that in mind. Kindness for all beings. So, thank you once again for being here. <laughs>